Welcome to Champlain Presents, a showcase of documentaries produced by students in the broadcast media program at Champlain College. I'm Zach Brady. And I'm Jake Davis. Here at the Media Factory, we have classes and work with the staff on our projects. At school, we work in teams to pitch our ideas, then write, shoot, and edit our stories. This year, we're taking a look at two sports. Jake and I did one about powerlifting. Can you imagine for a moment what it would take for a person to lift 600 pounds? That's like being able to pick up two full-sized refrigerators. Coming up, we'll introduce you to Jordan Bordeaux in the world of powerlifting and take a look at one man's quest to get a national title. But our first piece is about skiing, or more specifically, the effect of climate change on Vermont's skiing industry. With interviews from skiers, snowboarders, the resort operators and scientists, our classmates Bella Spano and Pat Hathaway tell the story about how the industry is adapting to a new weather landscape. Their story is called Steep Slope. In a number of um, variables, we see that winter has gotten about 10% worse in the last 10 years. I think that climate change is real and it's happening. You know, operations kind of swung left and right, um, so absolutely we're 100% impacted by global warming. I'm working with Mother Nature year round, and I would do anything to, you know, save the sport, but who knows? Maybe we'll just put a dome over the area. <laughs> Vermont's ski industry represents big money, about $1.6 billion in the 2022 season. 350,000 skiers hit the slopes and around 13,000 people are employed, but that industry is facing some major challenges. Because of warm weather, some resorts had to close temporarily and stockpile man-made snow for colder conditions. I think there has definitely been differences. Um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, um, you know, we would always say, oh, there's like a February thaw and it might get warm for a couple days, you know, in February or, or you know, sometime in the winter. Um, but what I've noticed is it seems like that just happens more frequently. This sparked the question, what happened to Vermont's snowy climate? Many experts believe the answer is clear, climate change. I've taught skiing for 45 years. Um, I started at age 15 as a junior instructor and I've gone all through the whole ranks of, of the instructing world. I've worked at Bolton for 20 years and here for 23 now. So um, I just enjoy the teaching aspect. Of it. That's the impact for me. I, I love watching the people get it and from age two on up, we've got kids out here at a year and a half old at this point that are sliding with their mom and dad. Cochran's is a tiny ski hill in Richmond that's historic, producing six Olympians in its time. But this legendary training ground is going through some change. We didn't get snow until about three weeks ago, you know, appreciable snow this winter. <laughs> and we're not up on a mountain here either. We, you know, we're right down here at river level. The Winooski is 100 yards away there, so. Well, it was definitely a hard year. It was definitely a hard year for us because it was warm. In a place like this, we're not, we don't have the elevation of most other ski areas. So the beginning of this year was a little rough. This year has been better, um, but you know, we're lucky, we're lucky for that. And uh, yeah, thank God for snowmaking. <laughs> Meteorologists see a broader change in the weather patterns. Haley Boulay forecasts weather for my Champlain 2244. My voice here because it's, it's such a cold, cold wind and combine that with the, uh, the snow well, climate change has definitely put a stop to a lot of our wintertime activities, not just the ski industry, but, you know, snowmobiling, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, all things that people come up here for the snow to, um, you know, pump our local economy. And if we don't have snow, people aren't coming. The National Weather Service has an office in the Burlington Airport. NWS staff track weather patterns and say they've noticed a change in snowfall over the past couple years. I, I think the one thing that's kind of the most obvious to me is a lot more kind of marginal events. So this year specifically, I'm sure you guys have seen, there's been a lot of events where we're saying, is it going to be rain or is it going to be snow? Even in, in December, January and February, we're having this conversation. And that wasn't a conversation we had 20 years ago. 
20 years ago when we had these big storms, they were all snow. Yeah, so Vermont has seen a, a rise in temperatures um, over the past few years um, in a variety of different ways. We're finding shorter cold snaps and um, less days below 32 degrees, um, which, you know, obviously can impact the snowpack. Bolton Valley Resort is a mid-sized ski area with 5,000 acres of high mountain forest, 71 trails, and 165 acres of skiable terrain. Like many other areas, Bolton is feeling the pressure of climate change. We're all investing more and more in snowmaking, including little old Bolton Valley. We're certainly putting much more onus on the snowmaking. So places like Killington will be skiing and riding until the end of May. That's on snowmaking. That's not on natural snow. The patterns um, are not patterns anymore, if you will. Uh, so, you know, in order for us to, to keep consistent with our opening dates, uh, definitely very reliant on snowmaking. Can't afford, we don't have the resources to blow that much snow, it's wildly expensive. If you want to extend your season, start earlier and later, the 90% of the winters, you're gonna be on snowmaking snow. The changes are happening. We can almost see them happening kind of season to season, which feels like it's in real time. So it's pretty urgent. Even though the number of, uh, of, of ski visitors to Vermont increased a little bit in 2022 compared to the previous year. The trend over the last 10 years has been down meaningfully. When it comes to snow reporting, uh, trying to predict future forecasts, I know Mount Man Mansfield is our reference point um, for all, all things snow. Mount Mansfield has been Vermont's indicator for snow. At 4,395 feet, Mount Mansfield is the highest mountain in the state. So on top of Mount Mansfield, there's about 50 inches of snow right now. Normally for this time of year, we have about 66 inches of snow. So we're running at about 16 inches below where we should be. Um, and again, then if you look at Mount Mansfield, which is at 3,900 feet, it tells a similar story. Uh, there, the snow stays a lot longer. It's like May 25th that they tend to lose their snowpack. And again, it's a couple days earlier in the last several years. Due to the height of Mansfield, Various elevations are measured to see how much snowfall they get. This data helps ski resorts figure out how much snow will be at a given elevation. Given the snow on Mansfield has been about 16 inches below average, that's been bad news for corresponding elevations at Bolton Valley. Uh, ultimately, it's hard to predict what we'll see next year um, when the years are just not kind of have, having a, a consistent pattern. Um, so definitely mm -hmm. uh, a little troubling. For many in the Vermont ski industry, what's troubling is the cost. Smaller resorts shoulder a heavier burden when making snow. Its production is tougher on the bottom line. Yes, some reports have shown that the 2021 to 22 season experienced a $100 million decline in revenue. As the weather continues to be erratic, how will ski areas thrive? Some places are turning their facilities into event spaces or summertime destinations. We've also re, you know, purchased the Ponds wedding venue and did a renovation of the Timberline Lodge to make both of those really first class groups, sales, events, and weddings destinations. There is no more waiting. Like to make this a viable business, it really needs to be a year round resort business. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just winter getting a little shorter. The Vermont ski industry is, is definitely looking at a period of significant decline, unfortunately. And so the urgency is is really high. Uh, you know, again, if we have 13 million visitors per year, certainly many people come here during the summer. The future of the industry is changing now that there's weather unpredictability. That uncertainty has many worried about what would happen if skiing and boarding were to melt away. We carry this victory of the season, you know, with a grain of salt. Um, knowing that it's not necessarily going to be the same trend next year. Um, so yeah, definitely something to worry about for sure. The issue is, is urgent. A significant portion of those tourists come in the winter and if the, the key winter sport of skiing, downhill skiing, alpine skiing is uh, declining 
because of these environmental factors, then um, you know we we really have an urgent need to to identify ways to replace that revenue in the economy. Skiing has been a big part of my life for, as I said, <laughs> much of my life. So it would be it would be really sad. I mean, it would be unfortunate. And I think it's a great thing that a place like this exists for the community around here. I, I just love outdoors and I love being one with, with the world, right? And that's what you're doing when you're skiing. And you get on the mountain and you just see how huge it is and what kind of geological consequences have forced that over the you know, millennia. And, and to be part of that is just really special for me. Um, we'll hope for the best. <laughs> We're still in Vermont, right? Or, Am I looking? You want me looking at you, Pat? <laughs> generally, you or? both write all the questions. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we're joined by Pat and Bella to talk about their documentary, Steep Slope. Now, the first thing I want to ask is, you, you did a deep dive into the world of the skiing industry. What did you learn? So Vermont hosts a 1.6 billion dollar ski industry. And that employs around 13,000 people, as well as having 350,000 skiers and snowboarders come up every year to do their leisure and sport activities. So it really impacts kind of a large amount of people. So you guys traveled all over the state of Vermont for this documentary. Was there anything that surprised you in making this? Like Pat said, all these people come to Vermont to go skiing. So one thing that has been really important over the past few years is snowmaking. So they have to make snow to keep up with less snow coming on the mountains. Um, so it really depends on your elevation, if you're close to a large or small body of water. And it's really difficult for some of these ski areas to make snow and keep up with the industry. All right. And now after all has been said and done, what was your favorite part about making this documentary? So I think my favorite part about this documentary was going to the different ski areas and just different places in Vermont. Uh, we met a lot of people, and the people at Cochran's were very nice, and Bolton were very nice, and mm. I've personally never been to these places before, so it was really fun to go out and explore. So we really got the opportunity also to see a lot of the natural beauty of Vermont. There's a lot of landscapes, mountains, and even in the ski areas that have just this amazing natural beauty, so we really got to go around and explore that. Well, thank you guys so much for answering our questions, and great job on your documentary. We'll thank be you. right back. If you've ever lifted weights, you might have some idea about how crazy this fact is. The subject of our next story can lift more than 600 pounds in what is called the deadlift. That's the ability to lift a weighted barbell just off the ground and stand straight up with it. Why would powerlifting like that be something that someone just has to do? That's what Zach and Jake wanted to find out. They met Jordan Bordeaux, a St. Albans powerlifter who has big ambitions. Their piece is called Deadlift. Last lift of the morning session, everyone. We got Jordan here with 600 pounds. Fire is loaded for Jordan. Hello, I'm Jordan Bordeaux, and I'm a sophomore computer and data science double major at the University of Vermont, and I compete competitively in the USAPL Powerlifting Federation as a 100 kg lifter. Ah. 
So I got into competitive lifting sort of as a result of my family's gym that we owned in St. Albans, Vermont. So we had opened up the gym in January of 2019 and then I worked there and I worked out there for a couple years. But over time, I kind of just grew to enjoy going to the gym for the sake of going to the gym. I just really enjoyed like going in lifting. Yeah, so powerlifting is a competition of the uh, squat, bench, and deadlift. So the squat is the one where you put the barbell on your back, you squat down, and you have to, uh, your hips have to go past your knees in order for it to count. The bench is the one where you lay down on a, a flat bench and you bring it down to your chest and you push it up. And deadlift is just the one where the barbell is on the floor and you pick it off the floor until you lock out uh, your hips. Our personalities will mesh well, our goals mesh well, that this is someone who I actually want to put a lot of effort into, um, and they're willing to go through the like standard that I hold people to, which he has done a good job of. It. From like a macro perspective, Jordan's progress has been very good, but there's been times on a micro scale where it has been poor, and that's going to be something that everyone faces because um, it's hard to get stronger, you know, uh, we're not like gorillas and we, <laughs> we don't just have like unlimited amounts of strength. So you really need to find what, what works, um, and what will be the right stimulus to make sure that you, you know, continue to progress someone without breaking them, so to speak. And then I found that I really just like pushing myself on like squat, bench and deadlift in particular. And so then I just really started pursuing that and I believe it was March 2021 was the first powerlifting meet I competed in. And from that point on, I just kind of really fell in love with the sport and just the process of training to get stronger. So from there, I just kept training like that. I really want to just keep lifting and keep pursuing it until I win some kind of national championship, whether that happens my 20s, 30s, 40s onwards, I really just want to stick with it until I reach some kind of high level like that. It's not easy to, for years on end, like make sure that you're getting enough sleep, make sure you're eating enough, like, tracking your food or eating enough like every single day sometimes forcing yourself to eat when you don't want to just because you know you need to eat more to get stronger and then like in the gym like you might be exhausted like dead tired but you still have to go in there and go hard because you know that if you don't then you're not going to be getting anything out of it I would definitely say it's kind of like a second family in some ways, like the group of people that we always see at Lifty Team we go, me and my girlfriend Bella started calling them the Kilo Crew. And so we're always looking forward to getting there and like, oh, who's, who from the Kilo Crew is going to be there tonight? Ah! Ah! Nice. My name is Ella. Um, I have just barely kind of gotten into powerlifting, but I've been lifting for a little while. Um, Jordan is my coach and he's also my boyfriend. I just had really for a while just wanted to get stronger. I grew up dancing. I started dancing when I was three and I danced for 15 years. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed it. But one thing I wanted was to just get stronger. And for a while, like that I hoped would better my dance technique. Um, and just better like my control and stuff. But I, once I got into lifting, I found like, I, that's just really what I wanted to do. And it was something I found really fun. Um, and then powerlifting specifically, um, I saw Jordan compete a little bit and I really didn't know much about the sport of powerlifting before I started like even just lifting at the gym and talking to Jordan about it. Cause it was an interest of his a little bit before it was an interest of mine.
Currently I'm lifting five days a week. Like I have to really make sure that I'm efficiently utilizing my time so that I can attend all my schoolwork and then also have time to go to the gym for like two to three hours. We're going to Target. So right now we're going to restock on milk and Oreos and a couple protein shakes, the essentials. So for someone who's a competitive power lifter, because their focus isn't going to be more on endurance and it's going to be lifting heavy and typically lifting maximal or near maximally often, you're going to need a lot of carbs predominantly because carbs have unique attribute when you look at macronutrients. So predominantly when looking at competitive lifters, you're typically, typically going to see a high carbohydrate diet and a high protein diet. Not to say that fat's not important, but for this population, high carbs, high protein going to be very common. The issue with the mega stuff is it's almost too big and so like even though there's a lot of cream and that goes well with the milk there's not quite enough like the cookie to cream ratio is all off so a lot of the times it'll just fall in the milk and then you have to like retrieve it with a spoon or something it's really it's really tough it's unfortunate a huge oreo fan love oreos a lot of the times my little snack runs will be something along the lines of like oreos and some fair life milk higher protein protein shakes and just a couple other like high carb snacks which I can use before the gym. Pop tarts are a favorite. Yeah, I'm signed up to do my first meet on April 22nd in Agawa, Massachusetts. And I'm going with a group of friends and Jordan is also part of that group. Um, so I'm really excited to just get on the platform, uh, really just see how strong I am. Like this is the first time I'm ever doing a meet like this. So it's just really exciting to see what that's gonna be like. She made it look a little harder this time just to confuse us, but it was a good lift. So I'm going down to Agawam Mass for my third full power meet and fourth meet overall. I'm going down with a bunch of friends and so it should be a pretty fun time with all of us competing together. I've been looking forward to competing at this meet for a little while now because this is by far the best prep I've ever had going into a meet. A few milestone lifts I'm looking to hit are a 551 squat, a 300 plus bench, and a 600 deadlift. The objective of the meet is to get the highest possible good lift, which is two or more white lights out of three possible white lights for each lift and secure the best possible total. You're always going to have those nerves running through you and so it's easy if you feed into that to just sort of like lose yourself and lose a lot of the form that you practice like every day and forget some of the cues that you do to keep your technique as crisp as possible in training. Bars loaded for Jordan, 275 pounds. They're back at the top of the order of Josh for the Terry and Will. On bench I started with 275. I've hit the weight a ton of times before in training, and so on paper should have been a pretty effortless first attempt. That being said, my first shot at it was a pretty rough misgroove. I slid on the bench on my right side quite a bit, and it definitely threw me off. On my second attempt, I was able to bench the weight pretty easily, but I was still a little shaken up by missing my first attempt and just ended up jumping the rack command, which resulted in me getting two red lights. For my final attempt, I took the same weight a third time, dialed in, and hit it to secure a total. Come with it until Jordan, this is third attempt. Easy, Jordan. Bars loaded for Jordan, 496 pounds. I started with 496 on the squat. I got it and it moved pretty well, so I felt confident going up to the top end range for my second attempt at 529. Come on, Jordan. I hit that way and it still felt like it was moving pretty well. And whenever a squat feels like it's moving well, I know I have quite a bit left in me since I tend to have a very slow and grindy squat. We got Jordan at 562 pounds. A teenager squatting 562 pounds. I was very nervous about loading 562 since it was still heavier than anything I'd ever had in my back before. And it was definitely one of the hardest squats I've ever done. But I 
got it and I was super happy about being able to scrape out every single possible kilo that I had in me on the day. That's a good look, Jordan. All right, Jordan, your turn. The last lift of the day was deadlifts. Deadlifts are always a bit of a challenge on meet day since you're still tired from the first two lifts and it can be tough to really get back in the zone. Going into the meet, the best lift I had managed to complete in training and hold on to was 579. And I felt confident with our tapering strategy that I'd be good for 600 on the day. I started with 529 for my first attempt and it moved super well. He brushed away the bad juju and lifted it up. So I felt very solid about going up to the top end range for my second attempt at 568. 568 pounds. I managed to take that, no issue. Making it easy all day today. And I felt confident that I was good for 600 on the day. So for my last attempt, I loaded 601. And Jordan here with 600 pounds. Fire is loaded for Jordan. and managed to make it, perhaps even with another five or seven and a half kg in the tank. I'm gonna kind of take a step back from this a little bit. My dad would always tell me like every day walking out the door, just like be all you can be. And that sort of became ingrained into my psyche. And that's sort of like my own personal mantra. And so for me, it's like, I love the sport. I love training in it and I love competing it. And so I really feel driven to like be as good as I possibly can at it. What's the goal? Well, I want to be a national champion. And in first place, Jordan. We're here with Zach and Jake to answer some questions about their documentary. So starting off, uh, how did you really meet uh, Jordan Bordeaux? And what kind of connection do you have? Yeah, uh, I first met him uh, my first year of varsity track and field, uh, which was my sophomore year. And that summer, we accidentally ran into each other in a science technology conference, uh, just kind of bumped into each other. And we started talking more, and we just became better friends since then. So we use narration during our documentary, but you guys didn't. Can you just talk a little bit about why you decided to do that? Well, it just kind of came organically, honestly. At, during the first interview, after hearing him talk for a little bit, we decided his voice is, he has a clear vision of what he wants to say and what he wants to talk about. So we decided that we should just let him tell his own story, you know? I mean, yeah, Jordan's very passionate about powerlifting and it just adds to the authenticity of the documentary. Yeah, you said he's passionate, but I'm really curious. How far do you think he's going to go with this? If I know Jordan, I know Jordan's driven. Uh, it's not going to be an easy task, but once he has a goal in mind, he's definitely going to try his hardest to reach that. Well, thank you guys very much, and good job on your documentary. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching Champlain Presents. We'd like to give our thanks to the Media Factory, Jess Wilson, and our professor, Keith Oppenheim. And thank you guys for watching and supporting student work at Champlain College. Is everyone ready? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bye. Bye.